opponent. In ordinary life, a place already reached can still be reached again in terms of change of environment. As, for instance, a man already on this earth may still reach it in terms of altered position. Similarly, a boy who continues to be the same person may be noticed in terms of change in the period of life, to be progressing toward old age occurring to himself. So also, Brahman may somehow become a goal to be approached by virtue of its being equipped with all kinds of power. Vedanta, not so. For all distinctions are ruled out from Brahman in accordance with such Upanishadic and Smriti texts and logic as without parts, without action, calm, free of blenishes, free of taints. Shvetashvatara 6.19 It is neither gross nor minute, neither short nor long. Brihararanyaka 3.8.8 since he is coextensive with all that is internal and external, and since he is birthless. Mundakopanishad 2.1.2 That great birthless self is undecaying, immortal, undying, fearless, and Brahman, that is, infinite. Brihadaranyaka 4.4.25 This is the self, which has been described as not this, not this, Brihadaranyaka 3.9.26 According to which it cannot be imagined that the Supreme Self can have any connection with any distinct time, space, etc., so as to be reached on the analogy of a particular place on the earth or a stage of life. The earth or age can well become the goal to be reached in terms of particular place or time, since they can have distinct localities and periods. Opponent Brahman can have different powers, since the Upanishads show it to be the cause of the origin, continuance, and dissolution of the universe. Vedanta, not so, since the Upanishadic texts denying distinctive attributes cannot be interpreted in any other way. Opponent, in the same way the texts about origin, etc., cannot be interpreted otherwise. Vedanta, not so. For their purpose is to establish unity. The scripture that propounds the reality of Brahman, existing alone without a second, and that proves the unreality of all modifications with the help of illustrations like clay, cannot be meant for establishing the truth of origin, etc. Opponent. Why again should the texts about origin, etc., be subservient to the texts denying distinction and not the other way around? Vedanta. The answer is that this is so because the texts denying distinction lead to a knowledge which is complete by itself and leaves behind no more curiosity to be satisfied. For when one has realized that the self is one, eternal, pure, and so on, one cannot have any more curiosity to be satisfied as a result of the rise in him of the conviction that the highest human goal has been reached and is known from such Upanishadic passages as, then what sorrow and what delusion can there be for that seer of oneness? Ishopanishad 7. You have attained that which is free from fear, O Janaka. Brihadaranyaka 4.2.4. The enlightened man is not afraid of anything. Him, indeed, this remorse does not afflict. Why did I not perform good deeds, and why did I perform bad deeds? Taitriya Upanishad 2.9.1 This is confirmed equally by noticing the contentment of the enlightened ones, and from the condemnation of the pursuit of unreal modifications in He who sees as though there is difference here, goes from death to death. Katopanishad 2.1.10 Accordingly, the texts denying distinctions cannot be understood to be subservient to others, but the texts about origin, etc., cannot give rise to any such self-contained knowledge that allays further curiosity. As a matter of fact, they are seen to aim at something else. Thus it is that, in the Chandogya Upanishad, the start is made with O oh, amiable one, know this sprout that the body is to have come out of something, for it cannot be without a root. 683. 
And then the Upanishad says later in, with the help of that sprout, try to find out the root that is existence, 686. That existence alone, which is the source of the universe, has to be known. Similar also is the text, crave to know that from which indeed all these creatures originate, by which they are sustained after birth, towards which they advance, and into which they merge. That is Brahma, Taitriya 3.1.1, where also the reality to be known is Brahman alone. Thus, since the texts about creation, etc., are meant for imparting the knowledge of oneness, Brahman cannot be possessed of many powers, and hence also it cannot reasonably be a goal to be reached. Any traveling towards Brahman is denied in the text, his organs do not depart. Being but Brahman, he is merged in Brahman. Brihadaranyaka 446 This fact was explained under the aphorism, for in the case of the followers of one recension, there is a clear denial of the soul's departure. Sutra 4.2.13 On the supposition, again, that there is such a thing as traveling, the traveling soul must be part or a transformation of Brahman, or something different from it, for traveling is impossible in a case of total unity. Namaste. Shankaracharya is so right. As soon as you hear, Brahman is one. Everything is Brahman. Aham Brahmasmi. I am Brahman. Tatvamasi. You are Brahman. This is the end of the topic. There's no more curiosity. Those are completely satisfying answers. But when you hear, like in Sutra 111, way back in the beginning of Brahma Sutra, that Brahman is that which is the cause of the material universe, its creation, its maintenance, and its destruction. Well, this raises all kinds of questions. How does Brahman, which is one, become many. How is the material creation created? <laughs> and so on. <laughs> A whole raft of questions. And we discussed this in detail back in the original Brahma Sutra series, which you can watch there. So he exactly nails the distinction between the relative knowledge and the absolute knowledge. The relative knowledge, as it is said, leaves you with more questions than you started out with, whereas the absolute knowledge satisfies everything. Because once you hear that you are Brahman, by nature, you have always been Brahman. You are nothing else but Brahman. And this body and mind and all the phenomena connected with it only seem to exist because of the covering of ignorance over our real nature. These upadis, that I am an individual. I am the owner of this body. Huh? I am the doer of so many actions to solve so many desires. I am the owner of this. I am the creator of that. I am the doer of this other thing. I am so-and-so spouse. I am the, you know, whatever titles and designations that you identify with. And these lead to innumerable, really, in the end, unanswerable questions. Because there's not enough time <laughs> in the whole existence of the universe to answer all these questions of where does this come from and who did that and why is this, you know, why is the sky blue? Isn't it? 
So we have to understand the difference between relative and absolute knowledge as relative knowledge being the cause of so many additional questions and absolute knowledge being the satisfying conclusion of everything. That's why this knowledge is called Vedanta. Veda means knowledge, also the Vedic literature, and Anta means the end or the conclusion. So Vedanta is the conclusion that leads to complete satisfaction of the mind and heart, where there are no more questions, no more curiosity. And you can go on to the really interesting part, which is looking for this identity within yourself. That's what it's really all about. All these philosophical discussions and ramblings and so on are just to give you a map, to tell you what to look for. But you have to actually sit down and search within yourself for these experiences. That's why the Vedic process or the Upanishadic process is neti neti. Not this, not this. It's not iti iti. Huh? This, and this, and this. It's the rejection of all that. The rejection of multiplicity until one comes to the unification of everything. That is Brahman. That which has no boundaries, no second, huh? one without a second, no qualities, no actions, no change, is never a doer, nor an object, and which is the source of everything. <laughs> And this is what you realize when you get to the end of meditation. Neti, 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 and there's nothing left. But then the question becomes, who is experiencing this nothing? Who or what am I? The experiencer, the seer, the knower, the witness. I'm not a doer, I'm not an owner, I'm not an enjoyer, I'm not the one identified with so many symbols and designations, names and forms. Well, then what am I? What else could I be except pure consciousness? And that pure consciousness is the first quality of Brahman, Sat. Sat chit, uh, the existence and the consciousness of existence. And this leads to ananda. Actually, all three of them are one. You can't separate them. If you have eternal, unlimited, unconditioned existence, you also have consciousness of that existence. And that is bliss. Because in that state, all desires are satisfied. There is no more hankering. Like it says in Bhagavad Gita, na shochati na kankshati. Huh? One who is situated in yoga neither laments nor hankers to have anything. Why? He already has everything. <laughs> and he can't lose it. So he can't lament. Or you won't lament. So this is the final state. This is the ultimate state. Where one is fully identified with Brahman alone. Now, this can also be reached indirectly through the conditioned Brahma. In which one comes into a relationship with Brahman in the form of the god and goddess. Like that. We've been over this so many times. In that case, there can be a journey. There can be a transformation. 
There can be going from one place to another or one state to another. But in the ultimate state of full identification with Brahman, there's no journey, no traveling, no transformation. Brahman is not an object and it's not a subject. Brahman is unconditioned, never becomes the predicate of anything. So in this way, we can understand that when we realize Brahman, all changes come to a stop. And that includes all questions, all curiosity, all thirst for knowledge. Because if, if there's no suffering and there's nowhere to go and there's nothing to do <laughs> and everything is okay, huh? I mean, not just superficially okay, but like really deeply, eternally okay. <laughs> there is no suffering. So what is the motivation for any further action? There's no desire. There's no wanting to have anything or be anything or do anything. Brahman realization means the end of all that. The end of duality the end of striving, and the end of suffering. Aung Tat Sat, Aung Shati Aung, Aung Namah Shivaya. <laughs>